I'm going to give you a teaching tonight called the apathy of options. Just feel the energy of that, the apathy of options. Now, in order to introduce this teaching, I'm going to give you an example. And this might sound strange, but if you really settle into it, it's fascinating how true this is. So let's say you went to a restaurant. And at the restaurant, you had 10 different options for your entree. And of those 10 options, you look at each option. And you decide that of those 10 options, the jumbo kale salad is for you. I happen to love kale, so I'm just projecting myself onto this example. <laughs> and we call it the jumbo kale salad because that sounds really big. <laughs> and then let's say in a different example, you went to the same restaurant in a parallel dimension and there was only three dinner specials. One of those options was the jumbo kale salad, and you chose it. The fascinating reality is the option where there is only three choices to make would actually give you more satisfaction of your meal than if you chose the same entree with 10 options. The psychology is the more options you have, the less fulfillment you're going to get from whatever you choose. That is fascinating. And in a world that we live in, where consciousness is waking up, everything is going towards the fifth dimension. But the marketing of the world is still very much in the third dimension. And what's the marketing of the world? And I'm not saying like there's this, I'm not talking like conspiracy wise. Because the fascinating thing about a conspiracy is that the conspiracy is that marketing is a form of social manipulation to get you to persuade you to make a selection by your own free will. So if anything comes about, you're the one that did it to you. <laughs> so the only conspiracy is some form of marketing that gets you into a state of persuasion where you tell yourself what you need, as if you're not already whole and complete unto yourself. And the hypnosis of marketing is to give you as many options as possible. And it gives you this false sense of power that I have all these options. I can customize everything exactly the way I want. You mean I have that power? I can make it the way I want? And the more options you have, the less fulfillment you will gain from it. Because the more fulfillment exists in the least amount of options. So in order to talk about the awakening of consciousness, we have to understand what it takes to put you asleep. And to put you asleep, all life has to do is barrage you with a hundred billion options. So many options that you don't even take the time to survey your options and choose an option because to take the time to select an option means you're not aware of other options. You might be missing something. You don't want to miss something, do you? Because then you're going to be left behind. You won't know how to have a conversation. And that's the scarcity tactic of marketing. Scarcity. You don't even, don't look at your options. Don't choose an option because then you're going to miss other options. And people walk around bombarded with options, clinically depressed, because fulfillment does not exist as a byproduct of options. Fulfillment is reflective of how aligned in the flow of truth 
you happen to be. Now, here's what's interesting. Have you ever been so intuitively aligned in the flow where you enter into a moment and before you even know your options, you just know already how you're being guided? Right? You open up a menu at a restaurant, you know what you're going to order. And maybe your mind goes, well, let's just take a step back. Let's look at all the options of all the things you're not going to order. But let's just take it easy. You ever had that? And then you look at all the options and you come back to the same thing you would have chosen instinctively. Because you know. When you're in the flow, you just know. And a lot of us can't trust that. So we need a thousand kabillion options to make sure we're not missing something. And what we're missing is the chance to be in the flow. When you're in the flow, you simply go where you know. When you're in the flow, do you know what you really don't have? Options. And all, or the majority of us who think we don't hear our intuition, it's because we think we have to have all these options in front of us, and then we have the job of deciding which of those is in the flow. But that's not how it works. Rule number three. In the flow, there are no options. There is simply truth. And if you're in a moment where you don't feel like you have options, it means exactly where you are doing exactly what you're doing is where you're supposed to be. When you don't like where you're at, but you have no option to move forward, it means you're in a moment that has the potential of transforming you into your highest potential if you can see it from a different perspective. Most of the time when we have a situation where we say, I don't like it here, I'm done. It's not untrue, it's just if you can see it from a fifth dimensional perspective, you'll realize why you're there you'll realize what you're learning. And I always say this in every video. I say that with the exclusion of abusive relationships. When you're in an abusive relationship, an abusive relationship, whether it's filled with neglect or abuse, is showing you the only option you need. And in that situation, most of us get hypnotized into going, well, I don't know where to go. Oh, but we do. It's just not a long-term plan, it's just the best short-term plan. And the best short-term plan in neglect or abuse is to go anywhere your neglector or abuser isn't. <laughs> and the ego goes, oh, but I don't want to sleep on my friend's couch. How bad does the abuse and neglect have to be until that's a paradise of salvation? Sometimes you have to get down to anywhere but here. But we are so bombarded with options in our society that we're hypnotized from actually just letting the flow guide us. Sometimes it's not a matter of knowing where to go, it's knowing where not to be. And if people are nasty enough, it makes it easy. Just look at a map of where you are, put a big, big X through where you currently stand and go anywhere else. <laughs> Just go where abuse isn't. And that's not a long-term plan, but it's the best short-term plan. The big hypnosis on the spiritual path is I have to know all of my options and then I decide what my intuition is telling me to do. That's not how it works. When you're in the flow, you just have a feeling that guides you and you either listen or you don't. And if you don't listen, life will turn up the heat until you're evicted out of the place you're meant to leave. And isn't the strange thing for the spiritual ego that is still identified with the 3D constructs? 
an ego that says, I don't think I'm free unless I always have a ton of options. And when you get put in a situation where you have no options, you tell yourself you're not free. But freedom is not options. Freedom is how you choose to view the moment at hand. You're free to see it however you want. And even for some of you that have studied from so many different paths, you've read all these different books, you've come from all these different spiritual paths, you have 10 different ways you can look at this moment. And do you know what that guarantees you? A lack of fulfillment. Apathy of options. Too many options, too many things to consider, you never make a decision. Because if you have too many options, the options are your power. And the decision means I'm gonna settle for one instead of sticking with 10. And to the ego, it says settling for one and not having 10 means I'm losing. So the ego would rather have 10 options, think about all 10 options 24 hours a day, and feel falsely abundant with 10 options, afraid that if it chose one option, ooh, I went from 10 to one, I'm losing. Do you see what I'm saying? But in this scenario, what you miss out on is actually following the guidance of your heart or your gut or your highest truth. We still live in a society that is propagating a certain amount of marketing that says more is better. And so then we're fighting with this perception of less, saying I have to keep gathering more to get further away from less. And as soon as I get in contact with less, I tell myself I'm missing something, so I have to run towards more in some way. So we're gathering more information, we're gathering more concepts, we're gathering more tools, we're gathering more social media apps, whatever it is, more games, whatever it is. It's all about more, 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 because we're all afraid of less. But guess what happens with less? Less options. And with less options, there's only the clarity and direction of your highest destiny. That was only a direction you followed when you had no other option. Destiny is a one-way street. And sometimes life has to eliminate all your options in order for you to know where you're meant to be. And the one, the ego, the one inside of us that is just trying to decide to figure all this out is just looking for more options to hide behind. Because the hypnosis is as long as I gather more, I'm further away from less. Because in our subconscious mind, there's an association that less equals pain. I once had a lot of friends. Then I had less friends, therefore I now have more loneliness. Do you see? There's an association that less means pain and more means safe. And in all of that, we are constantly trying to always give ourselves more and more options. And what does all of this option do for you but create on an egoic level a fear of commitment? Endless window shopping, no commitment. And it's our commitment to our choices that puts us into situations that guarantees our highest evolution. And we're so afraid of making the wrong choice that we don't choose anything and we wind up living the same scenarios day in and day out, wondering when's it going to change. When we give ourselves less options and start making decisions. Because the more options you have, 
the more apathetic, the more unfulfilled you're going to be. And the only way to keep fooling yourself is to have a hundred thousand options and to tell yourself, if I only had a few more, I'd feel better. That's you marketing to yourself. That's all the world can do is scare you with more means safety, less is scary. You don't want less, that's where the pain is. No, I don't want less. You need more, I need more. I need more, I definitely need more. That commercial is right. And isn't it funny how the commercials that tell you of the more you need happen to be companies that have more to supply you? Well, isn't that ironic? They say, you don't want less, you need more. Yes, thank you, TV, good point. I need more. Sponsored by a company that has warehouses upon warehouses of more. That's, there's, there's two types of marketing in this world. It's either the remedy for less is found in the safety of more, or you have to stop this in order for this to start. And it doesn't matter whether it's pharmaceutical marketing, it doesn't matter whether it's social marketing, it doesn't matter whether it's the headlines on a news program that is just trying to keep you watching the same station for the next quarter hour rating. It's simply coming down to two philosophies. More of something to avoid the pitfalls of less, or here's what we need to stop in order for the something better to start. And what keeps you swirling in that orbit is the apathy of options. And as long as you're caught in that matrix, you are fighting something, even with a justifiable cause. That's what we wake up out of. And the only risk is listening to someone like me and looking at me with that skeptical look, thinking he's trying to fool me. He's trying to trick me. Or that thought of if I actually do what he's saying, I'm gonna take my attention off of the world and I'm going to let all the bad things keep happening. <laughs> let me ask you a question. Let me ask you, you as in the audience and everyone in the world. Let's look at our day. What did you do today to prevent bad things from happening? Well, that's a good spiritual answer. And I appreciate that. And it's true. But to give love, it's not about stopping something in order to start something else. And the belief is, if I take my attention off of the world, more bad things are going to happen. Instead of seeing that the unconsciousness is simply cycling in unconsciousness and the way you can actually help bring the unconsciousness to an end is to wake up within it. To be one less person who can be put asleep. That's how you end the dream is to be awake within it. And in order for you to be awake, you have to be immune from the social marketing. And in order to do that, you have to know that more of anything does not protect you from the inevitability of less. That less is actually a part of our initiatory process of awakening. That the ego will perceive the threat of less and the threat of less is known by the ego as loss. Loss is how we sharpen the skill set 
of our deepest core values by being stripped of the things that give us a temporary form of comfort so we can just be comforted by the process of our own evolution. All of us will gain, all of us will lose in varying combinations of intensity. Some of us will lose seemingly a lot more than we gain. And some of us will gain and gain and gain, but never able to fill the whole of our previous losses. And you are only losing in a reality that is trying to free you of a need to remain defensive. Life is trying to expose our hiding spot so we can come out of hiding and say, I will gain, I will lose, and I will only gain and lose in whatever combination inspires my highest potential. Okay, life, I get it. Take what you want. Give me all that I'm meant to have. I'm done playing this game. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done believing more and more and more is going to take me further away from the pain of less. In fact, the more you have, the more having less will hurt you. When you allow yourself to live mindfully, you have what is truly meaningful to you, but it doesn't have to be in large quantities. When we eat mindfully to support our bodies versus when we're eating to fill the void of emotions we don't want to face, have you ever noticed that what the body actually needs nutritionally is a smaller quantity than how we eat when we're f eating emotionally? Different quantity. Because more is not the answer. More is only what we consume when we think it's going to make us safer or more immune from the threat of less. But if you were to consume less, your body would be healthier and more efficient. The ego's biggest threat is less. Less. And on the spiritual path, what is the ego? The ego is very clever, gets onto the spiritual path very quickly. It always wants to ask, what's my lesson in all this? What's my lesson in this, right? As the ego says, let me learn what I got to learn at record speed so I can get the hell out of this less and get back to more. <laughs> oh, I'm being stripped of all my defenses. I'm in the land of less, more insight. Do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, why is the universe not talking to me? Gee, I don't know, because it's freaking smart. Because it knows if it gave you more of anything, you would turn away from the ripeness being cultivated in you by less. Think of the word lesson. Take off O-N. What are you left with? Less. What causes us to learn? Having a lot, now having little, and seeing the difference. Wow, I used to have a closet full of clothes. Now I have three shirts and three pair of pants. What's hilarious about that? When you had a closet full of clothes, you only mainly wore the three shirts and the three pair of pants. But now because you don't have any options, now we've lost something. Do you see how hilarious that is? 
And the ego says, I liked it better when I had a shitload of options. I only wore the same things every single day. Right? You do your laundry, same three shirts, three, two, three pants. And a closet full of just in case. Do you remember that? Maybe you call it one of these days. Right? One of these days, Matt. Right? Because you never know when you're going to need a sombrero. You never know. It might be Taco Tuesday. And you might want to go all out. You never know. You never know. <laughs> That's what's hilarious about this. The ego protects itself by the gathering the coveting, the collecting, and the defending of objects. And as long as you are collecting and coveting objects, you're seeing yourself as an object. And then when other objects, known as other people, act the way they act, you get into the fight. I don't like the way that object sees me. I wish they saw me as a better object. I wish they saw me as a more spiritual object. When you wake up out of ego, you wake up out of object consciousness. And when you wake up out of object consciousness, you can't be sold anything. Things either resonate or they don't. You came here because you resonated, and I honor that, I appreciated that. But I didn't sell you on coming here tonight. I just offer, and you receive, and that's our relationship. It's a good one. So less is the inevitability of life, that you will wind up having less of something that you had a lot of to begin with. And what you'll find is when you had a lot of it, doesn't matter what it is, a lot of relatives, a lot of friends, a lot of responsibilities, whatever it is, as soon as it gets minimized down to less, you're gonna be more fulfilled by it. But the process of going from a lot to a little feels like a death. It's the death of ego consciousness. So what is it that a life of loss and suffering creates space for? Happiness and fulfillment. Therefore, apathy, sadness, depression, loneliness are all foreshadowing the happiness and fulfillment that's on its way. And to companies that have warehouses of crap that they need you to buy, that's not very marketable or popular, is it? And this would be more widely discussed if only a pharmaceutical company can bottle time in a capsule. Are you frustrated by life? Are you unfulfilled? Then you should buy time. <laughs> With more time, you have greater perspective, greater clarity. Now available in gel caps. <laughs> All you need is time. Because time is where your consciousness expands as your nervous system relaxes. And you know what relaxes our nervous system? The gift of less. Less. And you can manifest more of anything. But here's how the universe typically manifests quantities of more. And I'm not saying this is how it works for everyone. I'm saying this is how it works when you're an energetically sensitive soul, when you're already on a spiritual path, when you're already aligned with source. So this isn't for narcissists. That's different. Narcissists are given a lot in the very beginning, and it sets up for a deep existential crisis and a crash and burn situation. But if you're an energetically sensitive being, you can attract more of anything in quantity 
with two specific criteria. Life will give you more of something as long as whatever you have, you're using on a regular basis. And it will give you more of something as long as whatever the more you want, you'll be able to instantly utilize and implement. The universe will not give you something just in case. Mindfulness is when we only have as much as we need. Unconsciousness is finding a false level of safety or security in padding our lives with something called extra, just in case. Trying to protect yourself from the big scary thing called what if. What if. Here's a big what if. What if you only allowed yourself to store in your home exactly what you needed? And anything more than what you needed, you passed along to those who have less. Because hunger issues, financial issues, any issue in this world is not a lack of resource. It's a distribution crisis. In every one of our lives, there's something you have that crosses the threshold from what you need into just in case extra. And if you took that little bit of extra and passed it along to someone who seems to have less, we would all in our individual lives be balancing the socioeconomical scales. What if you didn't need extra anything? What if you only allowed yourself to have exactly what you need right now? What if allowing yourself to part with the things you don't really ever use on a regular basis opens up space for more happiness and fulfillment to dawn? What if what divides us from our natural state of happiness is having too many options? Imagine a soul goes up into heaven and meets with the light of God and says to the light of God, I lived an okay life, but deep down I was waiting for you to pick me for a special spiritual mission. And I was waiting for that mission and it never happened. So I ask you, God, why didn't you pick me? And could you imagine the reaction of the soul when God says, I didn't pick you because you wanted options. When you're chosen by the universe, you have one option, yes or no. Once you say yes, options are done. And when you truly take that to your heart, you'll smile because you'll realize it's all the options that kept you unhappy. A lack of options is nothing but clear direction forward. <clears throat> A lot of people don't think they're in tune with their intuition. The truth is you, you can't disregard your intuition because it's kind of like one of those moving walkways in the airport. You can walk on the walkway or you can stand still and it moves you forward. <laughs> 
You can't really get your life path wrong. You really can't. But what you can do is bombard yourself with so many options that you never actually make a choice to feel like you're a part of your life's process. And if you want to actually be aligned in your soul's highest path and you want to start feeling incredible fulfillment, happiness, and joy without having such spiritual work to do, without getting into the spiritual tangent of, I got to stop all these things to start something better. Got to stop ego, stop my mind, stop my karma, stop, right? Let's, t let's just go down the list. In order for me to start X, Y, and Z, that's falsehood. That's illusion. The reality is you want to be aligned. You want to feel as if you are participating in your highest destiny. Less options. And all you have to do is start by giving yourself no other option but to be exactly where you are right now, which is pretty easy because you're already there. You're already there, which means you've already arrived. That's the hard part. You're already there. The next step is even easier. Now that you're here, take every other option and put it aside. And wait until you laugh at how simple and profound being aligned in truth happens to be. Do you know why the recognition of eternal truth is hard for people to realize? They have too many options. And they're under the impression that it's they are the one that chooses the right option called truth. There are no options in truth. There's just truth. Let's be honest. You know what truth is? Truth is the disappearance of options. Right? Someone says, the sky is fuchsia. Someone says, the sky is green. You look up, nope, it's blue. There are no options in truth. There's just truth. And we all want the truth, but we're afraid of it because we've been hypnotized to find false levels of comfort and safety in a hundred kabillion options because it makes us feel like we have the power to make the right choice. But the more options you have, the less you choose. And the less you choose, the further away you get from your ethics and values and morals. And then you step into the land of loss, not the land of lost. The ego thinks it's the land of lost because it thinks more is what keeps it safe. But loss, is what strips you away from your confusion, strips you away from the apathy of options, and takes everything off your plate that is the extra you don't need, and leaves you with only what you are required. And even if you have no home, you have no clothing, and you have no support, what can you not be stripped of? Your breath. And at the end of the day, no matter how deeply you are stripped of all of your safety mechanisms, it is only so that you can begin again in a brand new timeline where you say, all I need is my breath. And when you say that to yourself, life goes, ah, now we have a being who's awakening. And we find comfort in breath. We breathe in, we breathe out. Has your breath ever stored a little extra breath just in case? No, it takes in all the breath and goes, oh, I don't need this. <sighs> See how mindful that is? I breathe it all in. Oh, I need all the breath. Mm, I don't need that much. <laughs> That's mindfulness. Awakened consciousness begins with all I need 
is to be aware of how safe I am when I rely on nothing but my breath. And then when aligned in our breath, we go to step number two, which is life will only take away from me what distracts me from living in full accordance to my highest ethics, morals, and values. And often times in a human society, the more of anything you tend to have, the further away from your ethics you tend to be. It's not always that way, but it usually is. Because typically in an ego structure, when you have more of anything, now you have more to defend by calling it something called mine. You ever seen children fight over something neither one owns? That's mine. That's mine. And children rip it out of each other's hands and push each other. But as adults, we do it on just, a, just with more sophisticated sentence structures. We just do it in a more passive aggressive fashion. At least kids are more direct. That's mine. Right, as adults, more passive aggressive, right? Someone's backing up their car. Excuse me, excuse me, hello, hello. The threat of losing mine. Oh my God. The spontaneous or perpetual loss of anything is not an indication that you are failing to access the law of attraction. Because even the way it was previously taught, it was like, here's just a more spiritual version to make sure you're always gaining more and more and more to fight the pitfalls of less. But if you knew the therapeutic benefits of having less, you wouldn't fight life when it's trying to take distractions from you. That's not what the law of attraction actually is. The real law of attraction is any amount of loss and gain is happening purposefully, governed by a divine intelligence that is only giving me or taking from me what will help me step into the next level of maturity of my highest potential. If I gain, it's only because it's going to make me better. If I lose, it's only because it's going to make me better. Are you ready to play by those rules? Because if not, this is going to get really, really intense. And if it's already intense, then we might as well jump onto this side of the playing field. And if you're ready to be chosen for your highest spiritual mission, then you step out of the matrix and you say to the universe, I'm ready to be chosen. Give me what I'm ready to handle. Take away every distraction. Rip it out of my hands. Dissolve it out of my reality. And spare no expense in making me as exquisite as I'm meant to be. Someone once asked me, Matt, when you talk to the universe, what do you say? I say two words to the universe. Do you know what they are? No mercy. No mercy for me. Mercy for any other person who needs more of anything. No mercy with me. Because I came into this game to shine and to shine brightly. And if I am going to shine brightly by having more of anything, I'll happily receive it. Thank you very much. And if having less of anything is what I need, then take it from me now. And what you'll learn from that type of ridiculously semi-scary teaching, (laughs) 
or relieving teaching if you tune into it. The deeper part of you goes, I don't know why, that sounds a little scary, but it's actually kind of relieving. I don't know if I want to say that, but I kind of like it. Because what it will do is it will free you of object consciousness. It will free you of any perception of social or spiritual materialism. If I gain, it happened on purpose, and life did it because I was ready for it. If I lose, it happened on purpose. Not because of something I did wrong. See, isn't it the funny belief we still have? Reward and punishment? Life took something away from me. What did I do wrong? Like the entire universe is watching your every move, and if you don't do something perfectly, it takes crap away from you? Like, is God this big narcissist? That's it, that's it. They weren't grateful for the fifth night in a row. Take their soulmate now. Is that how you think it works? And we laugh because deep down we think, you know, I... I, I we would rather subscribe to thinking that's how life works because we don't know how to be happy with less. And that's why life gives us less, is to find happiness. That's where happiness is, is in just having what you need. but you can't know how fulfilled you'll be by more of anything until you're totally satisfied by just what you have right now. And when you're totally satisfied by what you have right now, you'll realize why life's not giving you more. Because life's giving you a chance to be totally fulfilled by what you have right now. The minute you become fulfilled by that, that's when life says, now they're ready for more. And that's why the power of gratitude is so potent. Gratitude says, thank you for giving me what I need. And when I pretend that more is the answer, thank you for not listening. Thank you for giving me only what I need. And if it's a noisy mind, I guess I need that. Because here's the setup. The setup is that life is trying to free you of every single one of your limiting beliefs. And it puts you only into situations that trigger the beliefs that you still believe. Where life can take something away from you and you say, this is happening because A, B, and C, only to free you of the belief of A, B, and C. So the real thing to watch out for is when adversity strikes. And adversity is the heat that arises in your body to melt cellular memories when your ego goes from having more of something to all of a sudden having less. From more to less creates the alchemy, the heat that melts the rigidity of ego and brings about the light of your soul. And the thing to keep aware of is when you go from more to less, or some of us from less to even less, pay attention to what are the reasons you're telling yourself for why this is happening. Because I'll tell you what it isn't. It isn't your vibration. Your vibration is not the reason why you gain and lose. If that were the case, why are narcissists wealthy? They don't subscribe to those rules. It's just what we think is true, what we've been taught. Everything is on such a bigger level than that. It's not about, and you know why people believe it's their vibration? Because then they think that they can control it. Oh, it's my vibration that causes it. So I'm going to keep my vibration extra high and I'm going to walk around Om Shanti, Om Shanti, Om Shanti, which is my way of saying cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. 
Om Shanti, Om Shanti, Om Shanti. Right, you go check your little bank account. Keep pressing refresh. Om Shanti, Om Shanti, Om Shanti. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Lovingly, innocently, acting on the inside like a spiritual lunatic. <laughs> Thinking that you are the reason why you gain and lose. Let's make up rule number four, right? Feels about time for rule number four. You are not the reason for your gains and losses. Your evolution is the reason for your gains and losses. Not you, not your behavior, your evolution, meaning your gains and your losses are simply designed to orchestrate and manifest who you're meant to be. So the idea that there's reward and punishment in the universe is a 3D construct we wake up out of. You're better off assuming that when adversity arises, ask yourself the question, what did I do right? What did I do right to bring, up, to bring up on all this spiritual evolution? Oh my God, all my friends left me, my dog ran away, my house is on fire. Evolutionary wise, nailing it. Look at all this space that I'm creating for new. Ha <laughs> ha! Wow, the death of the old, the beginning of the new. I would rather live in a spiritual reality where when you lose, your friends go, now what did you do right to make that blessing happen? <laughs> Instead of this garbage of, God forbid you're in adversity and someone says, why do you think you manifested that? <laughs> Has anyone ever found that to be helpful? <laughs> right? You're on the losing side of reality and someone's trying to point out how shitty of a manifester you are. <laughs> it's not very helpful. Hey, you're sad and you're wrong. Yay! Yay! Oh, so soothing. Mm. It is so much more helpful. And again, oh my God, that happened to you. Congratulations. That's so much more helpful. Congratulations. Congratulations. And I'll tell you a real conversation I had with someone I did a session with. And before I even had the chance to do any kind of magical thing, my words were the magic. And they came to me and I said, so how are you doing? And they said, well, I've been diagnosed with cancer. And I took a breath and I kind of smiled. I smiled, that's all I did. Half time, I don't even know where I'm going with things. I just kind of ride the wave. They go, why are you smiling? I said, I can't wait for the day. I'm diagnosed with cancer. And they looked at me. They said, don't say that. I said, do you think, is that, is that how I attract it? Am I going to create cancer by wanting it? Right. How many of us who have ever been diagnosed with a healing crisis remember being seven years old, secretly wanting it, and then going, oh my God, my seven-year-old vision board finally came true. <laughs> you can't want something into existence. I told him, I said, I can't wait till I have cancer. I'm going to be so lucky when I do. And in that moment, their perspective changed. And they didn't know what the hell I was talking about. Either did I, to be honest. But all of a sudden, we were not talking about something to run away from. And they said, well, why would you be lucky to have cancer? And I turned to them and I said, why are you lucky to have cancer? And then the conversation changed. Because I'm not here to help you fight. 
I'm not here to help you stop one thing to have something else. That's nonsense. I'm here to help you make sense with you have attracted every form and degree of gain and loss for your evolutionary benefit. And you are free to tell yourself any limiting story and reason as to why you did something wrong to make happen what you don't know how to deal with. But every single moment is designed to bring about your maturity by squeezing out of us the immaturity that does not know how to live with less. That's what's being exterminated. God forbid there's a global blackout. That's not some shadowy government doing that. You know who's doing that? Your spirit guides. Turn their phones off for five minutes. Let them meditate. <laughs> oh my God, a global blackout? We'll have to use candles and talk to each other. Oh my God. Oh my God. And technology is a wonderful tool. Here I am using technology to connect with all of you on YouTube, and I bless the opportunity to do so mindfully. But technology can be used very unconsciously by giving you so many more options than you need. The hypnosis is, or how you wake up from the hypnosis, you've been given a lot of options in this techno technologically driven world. The first step of waking up out of the hypnosis is realizing one fundamental thing, and that is how many options do you actually have, even just technologically? The options of apps, the options of social media, you have all these options. How many of those options do you regularly exercise, for real? Like even if you look at your phone, how many apps do you have? How many of them do you really use every single day? Or is it that just-in-case stuff? Just like the closet, just in case. Or the pantry in your house, just in case. That's how you wake up out of the apathy of options. And I, and I share this with you because one of my spiritual paths is not having in my life anything I don't need. If I don't use it regularly, I donate it to someone who does need it. Here's a social, socioeconomic way of thinking of it. If you have something you don't need, and that's the category, need, meaning use regularly, there is someone else in need who can benefit from it. And the more you circulate energy by taking the things you don't need and giving it to people who do need, the more we are raising the vibration of the socio-economical climate of this world. Because other people are outer layers of your energy field. And when you take what you don't need and give it to people on the outer layers, now the totality of your energy can raise in vibration. That's why generosity and mindfulness are attributes of the soul. Do you know why meditation is so powerful? Because meditation is sitting in a moment without options. If you have an option, there is no benefit to meditation. The minute you do not have an option, your meditation begins. What is meditation? Have a seat. Choose to be nowhere else. And the mind says, then what? But that would be an option. 
That's it. Do you know I'm, one of the reasons my transmission can be so potent when you receive it? Because as you're listening to me, you're not giving yourself another option. So there can only be benefit in what I'm saying. It also helps them channeling. There's that. But here's a really fascinating question. How much more would every moment of your life become fascinatingly insightful if you gave yourself no other option? People can only bother you and rob you of your time if you think there's somewhere else you're supposed to be. Someone comes up to you, and if they've come up to you, then obviously the universe has approved this. And you think, I need to go somewhere. Now, the person who the universe brought up to you is robbing you of your time. Do you see? Options did that. If you, oh, I'm on the way to going to my family function, and the person steps up, can I have a moment of your time? Apparently, I'm going to be late. Sure. Moment of my time. Absolutely. That's surrender. At the end of the day, the greatest confusion you're going to be in and it's my honor to always have the opportunity to dialogue with you and to answer questions and to help you have breakthroughs. But your greatest pitfalls and breakdowns are when you have too many options. And your greatest breakthroughs occur when you eliminate your options. From the perspective of ego, the belief is, with less options, I'm more imprisoned. The truth is, from the soul's perspective, the less options, the more free you are. Because what are you free from? The inner conversation of comparing and contrasting your options, building up the momentum of being afraid of making a decision because you're afraid you're going to miss out. So what you become free of is the inner conversation of believing more options creates more fulfillment. And what you're going to learn continually in this world is less options brings about more of your deepest potential. You ever seen someone do something heroic? and then interviewed by a reporter, how did you in that moment do that magnificent act of heroism? And they said, I didn't have any other choice. You ever hear things like that? And you think, I wanna be that person. And then life says, but in order to be that person, you can't be so attached to your options. Are you ready to hand over your options? <laughs> right? Where'd the hero go? <laughs> and even in surrender, do you want to know why handing over your options isn't even what causes surrender? Because if you were to hand over your options, that would be an option. Surrender isn't you handing over your options. Surrender is life robbing you of your options. Let's be honest. So my advice is take all your options, Hold on to them as tight as you can, and life is going to mug you. <laughs> and the good news is, because what's doing the mugging is time, you're going to be holding on to things until one day you're just going to look at your clenched fist going, I was holding on to something. And isn't that an interesting point? To hold on to something can only be done with a clenched fist. The same clenched fist that symbolizes fight. So if we don't hold on, which doesn't occur because of your options, it occurs because of life's most precise trajectory of evolution in you, you realize the open hand is the symbol of receiving. 
Open hands always receive. Clenched fists always fight. So we stay open to receiving. Using the power of gratitude to be grateful for all that we have. Knowing we only have as much as we need to get to the next level of consciousness. And if the next level of consciousness requires you to have more of something, that's why it shows up. And if the next level of consciousness requires more deconstruction and you have less of something, that's the next thing to adapt to. But you're never going to have less breath. So we always abide in the primary form of abundance. The primary form of abundance is I always have all the breath I need. Be abundant in your breath and know that you only have as much or as little of anything else as you need to awaken to your highest potential. That's what is so difficult for so many of us to truly get because we're mesmerized by so many options and the belief that more protects you from less or I gotta stop, stop, stop in order to start, start, start. What do we learn from music, from artists, whether in music, in paintings, in story, or in movies? We see a character that has something. They go through a journey of having less of that something. And they go through a journey of being stripped of something through the land of less. And magically, by having less than what they had in the beginning, they wind up building more and more character. And in case you haven't noticed, that's how this reality is designed. Don't define your happiness by the more or the less objects you acquire. It's all a big setup only to give you more and more character. And if having more character is not fulfilling yet, it's gonna be a bumpy ride. And if having more access to your deepest character can slowly become the greatest prize you've ever been given, then there is absolutely nothing life can take from you that is going to destroy you and shut you down. It's only gonna open you up in the most unexplainable way. And just as a way of sharing my heart with you, because I'm speaking directly, I'm speaking fiercely, and my life is not immune from this journey. I just happen to take this journey quite directly. I've said no mercy to the universe, and apparently the universe was listening. Because <laughs> over the last year, the universe has had no mercy with me, and I have not complained. I've been too busy picking up the pieces of my heart and trying to put it back together. A lot of you have, have watched the recent videos I've done where I talked about the sudden and spontaneous loss in my life where my beloved and I came together. We got married. Engaging in the deepest romance we've ever known. Naturally, we take turns bringing up in each other what needs to be healed. And in my relationship with my beloved, we've never had a single argument. It was just an energetic dynamic where what she needed to heal and what I needed to heal surfaced. And out of nowhere, in the midst of being a newlywed, it was as if the energy between us disappeared.
It was as if a gust of wind blew into my life. And for both of us, in one moment, we were looking at each other as husband and wife. And the gust of wind came in, and all of a sudden, from husband and wife to acquaintances like that. And both of us, dumbfounded, looked at each other, wondering where our love went. In both of our lives, we gave up everything to bring our love together. She moved her life from a different state to move in with me. I rearranged the furniture of my reality to welcome her in. And here we are settling into our life together. With the depth and intensity, like literally being a newly wed on my honeymoon on a cruise ship. And my wife says, I'm gonna take a little walk, honey, I'll be right back. And now it's the morning time and divers are looking for her body. That's how intense this was for me. Since the age of 10, I had been looking for my wife, waiting for the day to be a married man. And that's my truth. And it wasn't like any, every person I met I put into this category. I was waiting for the one. To the degree that I was single for eight years and completely off the market because I was under the impression that if I was going to engage in a relationship with any person that was not realistically someone who I felt was my wife, I was cheating on her. That's how serious this was to me. And I lived like a monk for eight years, calling my wife in, calling my wife in. And then we met, it happened. We came together, the magnetism was undeniable. It was all magic, it was our fairy tale romance. All synchronicities, We pulled the same angel cards, Disney soundtrack, the whole thing. <laughs> she rearranges her life, I rearrange my life, and here we are, together as one, it's you and me, honey. And a gust of wind came in out of nowhere, not even an argument, not even an argument, not even, not, not even life giving the benefit of like, I could look back and go, did I do something wrong? right? Robbing me of the beauty of imaginary self-reflection. On a day where everything was spectacular. <sighs> Gone. Done. Goodbye. And both of us were dumbfounded. She didn't know where our love went. I didn't know where our love went. What the hell just happened? And both of us having the same question. How did we get in this mess? And a lot of you know from watching the videos where I've, t I've talked about this, alluding to it. And I didn't specifically talk about it like I'm doing right now because I had said in the video, things have a happy ending. And when I was making the videos and talking about it, I was still living that out. And she and I got to a place where that gust of wind took everything we had together and just made it disappear. And we did our best to try to rekindle. And you get to that place where it's like, you know, I just don't know what happened. And we had to let each other go. And in the, I'm trying to think which video it was, 
right at the end of the video, I'm actually looking at her in the front row and I'm crying. I'm in front of you, not planning this, letting her go. And we both let each other go. And I will be very honest with you. It didn't leave me bitter. It didn't leave me resentful. I just sat with, thank you for this gift, no matter how confusing it is, and I let the fire burn whatever in me needed to be taken and somehow able to maintain a full-time speaking schedule while dying on the inside. And my greatest gift to you is dying in your presence to show you how we can all do this together and to be valiant in our dying so that we can do the most enlightened thing possible, which is not allow our hurt to motivate us to hurt other people. I've never blamed her. She's never blamed me. We went through this like rock stars, not because we had an image to uphold and all that. Because when life flips your reality upside down, you really see what you're made of. And we both had to let each other go as newlyweds. And you know what happened when we both let each other go? It all came back. It all came back and we met as two different versions of ourselves. The first chapter of our marriage was the dance of she wanting to marry me and me wanting to marry her. And the next chapter that came together was actually the woman who was ready to be married to me and the me who was ready to receive her as my wife. And my beloved Allie and I are not only back together, but we are better than ever. I love you, honey. She's supposed to be here tonight. She's actually at home sleeping because she's a little tired. But we're better than ever. And do you know what we have right now in our marriage? Aside from the most in outrageously intense journey that brought us together, that she and I can survive this together. We are so connected than ever before. But do you know what she and I don't have? A fear of loss. Because we both lost each other already. We both lost each other, not even like someone did something wrong. and not, No, we lost each other in such a swift and unexplainable way. We just lost. Lost. Only to let go and to gain each other as we were always meant to be. And we only held on as long as we did because we thought it was those versions of ourselves that were supposed to be together. We didn't know until we let go that it was who we both became by letting go of each other that would bring to the surface the true husband and wife that we are for each other now. And that's real. And I had to, I was in a mindset of I was married. I've waited my entire life to meet my beloved and my fairy tale got shattered. And all I could sit with is, thank you. Thank you for shattering my idea. And actually, what we have now is the greatest fairy tale dream come true that either of us could ever imagine. The love we have is so unimaginably fulfilling and we are so connected on every level 
It's outrageous. Because there is no barrier between our hearts. And what used to be the barrier was this glass wall on both sides called, I love you, but I can't give all of myself to you because I'm too afraid to lose you. And I needed to lose her and she needed to lose me to break that glass barrier in both of our hearts and to let both of our hearts bleed out until the puddles connected and brought us back together. This experience for me personally was so catastrophically miraculous, so absolutely immaculately, perfectly created and orchestrated. I'm not just gonna sit here and say that I am not afraid of losing. Because as a child, I spent my entire life afraid to lose. And I spent my entire life gobbling up more and more and more because I was afraid to go without. I was afraid of missing something. And then I'd have all this stuff and I'd never use it. Like when I was a kid, true story. True story. When I was a kid, I had a lot of toys. My parents bought me anything I wanted. He-Man, G.I. Joe, Transformers had it all. Had a toy chest full of toys. And I will share with you one of the very first spiritual realizations I had that I had in the moment I had it, I knew something powerful was happening, but it took me 25 years to actually process what I was taught. One day when I was a kid, I opened up my toy chest and I pulled out all my Transformers, my He-Man, and my G.I. Joes. And I set up in my bedroom the most elaborate war between He-Man, Transformers, and G.I. Joes. I assembled it all in my room from every shelf to every corner to every particle of my carpet covered with toys. And it was the greatest epic war that was going to unfold. And I set it all up. And the minute it was time for my imagination to soar, and this is a true story, I stopped in my tracks. And I just, for two minutes, silently with this blank mind, looked around my room. And the clutter of all this stuff everywhere felt more overwhelming than the joy of whatever the hell I was setting up. <laughs> and before I could actually engage with my imagination and my childhood toys, I literally just stopped and one by one, I put it all away in my toy chest and I sat down in my room and I just stared at a wall. And it took me 25 years to figure out that in that moment, I had everything a child could have wanted. Every He-Man, G.I. Joe, Star Wars, Transformers, whatever. I had it. I had it. And all it did was give me the false illusion of having something. And the minute I went to play with it, to engage with it, it was too much. I set up an entire little scene in my room, the most epic adventure for my little child mind to have. I set up this elaborate scene only to have more stuff to put away. And I sat there and in my little eight-year-old mind, I remember even having the thought, I thought having all of this stuff was gonna was, was the feeling was, I thought it was gonna make me happy. I, th those weren't the words I used because I was eight, but the feeling was, how come this isn't working? Do you know what I mean? How come this isn't working? Because I had too much. 
And then fast forward from eight years old to now being an adult, and I have the one thing I've been waiting my entire life to have, a wife, the one, the magical angelic wife, and she is man magical and angelic. Honey, you are. And then I lost. I lost it. I lost it. And all it did was break me open. And it broke her open. And then we both knew the grace of gain. And if I can turn back in time, step through the annals of time, and step into my bedroom to meet that eight-year-old me, I would look at that eight-year-old me and I would say, my beloved Matthew, you only wanted all these toys because the moment you saw the commercial, you saw what you didn't have. And you thought by having more, it would give you more fulfillment and more adventure because you didn't want to miss out. In your eight-year-old mind, you thought, well, the crap I have doesn't seem like that great. There seems to be cool things on TV. The kids on TV seem to be having a fun time, even though they're paid actors. I must need that. And that eight-year-old me would be sitting in my bedroom, dumbfounded why, having all the toys in the world didn't do anything. And I would say to that eight-year-old me, it's not about having more of anything. It's about who you become when life takes it away. I know what it's like to lose. I even had situations where even when this happened to me over the last year, I'd have people like, oh, well, that's what happens when you get attached to things. <laughs> no. No, ma'am, no, sir. True spiritual beings know that what they gain, they're going to lose. But the truly bold beings create attachments Attachment is not like an egocentric thing. Attachment is a word for creating connections on an emotional level. You know what comes is going to go. You know what you gain is going to be lost. And you still dare to emotionally connect for the chance to know the love that you are in the presence of another. That's courage. We don't live these lives to stay safe, and there's no need to try to live in an unsafe, unmindful way. But your greatest opportunity is to give yourself to the love that you are in the presence of another, and let life carve whatever storyline that both of you need to become your highest self. If you love and lose, you'll only gain on a deeper level. And I say this to you as someone who had been preparing myself to teach with my journey being, I loved with all my heart and it blew up in my face. And I was prepared for that. Not to, not, not to be ashamed of that, not to think I did anything wrong, but I was prepared to face that music. And in private, she and I supported each other through this process. We alternated, took turns taking our medicine, and we let go of each other completely. And every day we experienced the death of us. And then we were reborn.
And here's what's so fascinatingly outrageous about this. As someone who's an intuitive, I always knew she and I were meant to be together. Just because you intuitively know it doesn't mean anything. You don't rest in your intuition and go, oh, well, we're meant to be together, so this is okay. No, it's, it's, it's like more mind-boggling. I know we're meant to be together. Why is she driving away? Where is she going? Here's a reality check. You have exactly the amount of security or lack of security when you're 100% intuitive as someone who has no access to their intuition. Because someone who has no access to their intuition has no idea why this is happening. Someone who has all the intuition in the world saying, it's going to end up like this, why is this happening? Both people, even though one has all their intuition and one has no intuition, are asking themselves the same question, why is this happening? Because you cannot outsmart the gift of loss. And I never tried for a minute. I just didn't get in its way. When you wake up, the process of waking up, you get really good at dying. Dying to your own expectations. The death of what you had that now you have less of. You get good at loss. And it only makes us into greater versions of who we're meant to be. I can say without a shadow of a doubt that this made me the best version of myself I've ever been. This was the greatest gift I've ever been given. And I was saying that to people before she and I got back together. And a lot of you know me privately, I've been saying that. This is the greatest gift I've ever been given. This is, a, I said to people in my inner circle, this is exactly what I needed. I needed this. I needed this. Because I came into contact with this little boy in me who was afraid of losing. I needed this. I needed to be cracked wide open. I needed this. And I got exactly what I needed. And as it turned out, it brought us back together. And when we came back together, I had no clue it was going to happen. It was as surprising as the end. And it took both of us a little bit of time to settle back into it because it spooked the crap out of us. <laughs> That's real. And the beauty of the story I'm telling you is that when this was taken from me, I had no option. She had no option. And when our love came back, it wasn't as a result of any options we exercised. Our end and our, re and our re-beginning, neither one were options. It was just life, doing what life does. And we're better because of it. And I'm sharing this with you as a personal way of distilling everything I transmitted in this talk tonight and making it so personal and so real. So on the inside, like if you tune in energetically to the room, to yourself and to the room, do you notice how there's no mental conversation right now? It's just silent. And when someone's mind becomes really busy, do you know what the mind is? Like people go, oh, thought. No, no, no. Do you know what it really is? Options. Just the noise of options. Listen right now. No options right now. And just this mixture of, oh, wow, I really get this. Oh, God, what's going to happen in my life? <laughs> as, as if... As if me talking so directly about reality is going to make life take more things from you, right? <laughs> I don't do that. Life already is doing a really good job at that. I'm just trying to narrate the adventure so we can get on to this. 
listen to your mind. Nothing going on. Do you know why? This is the sound of no options. And in a mind with no options, you're telling life, I'm ready to be guided. A silent mind tells God, choose me right now. I'm ready to get in this game. Choose me right now. Take me, I'm yours. And it's that silence of being that you're perhaps more in tune with through this transmission than ever before that dissolves the apathy of options, eliminates the belief that more of something will free you of less, frees you of the stop this so better things can start. That liberates you from the constant internal and external fighting of the third dimensional matrix. This is the fifth dimension. And it doesn't matter whether you feel connected to other people or not. The connection we have to one another is not an idea. It's not something you track. It's not something you can hold in focus. It's kind of like seeing that whether your fingers know that they're a part of the hand, the hand still functions. The fifth dimension is all of your doing stems from your inner beingness. And the beingness wakes up when you are no longer hypnotized and paralyzed by options. Because more options doesn't make you more free. Your freedom comes to life in a field of spaciousness. And the spaciousness is revealed when you stop asking for more options and start saying thank you to what has been given. Not all of us are at the level of maturity to truly take that in, but the reason you're going through everything you're going through is to bring that maturity to light. Third graders are not prepared for the fourth grade, which is why by the end of fourth grade, no third graders remain. High school students are not prepared for college which is why every semester in college, the mentality of high schoolers disappear, disappear, disappear. Egos have no business in the soul's reality, which is why every step towards the light of your soul, the ego withers and withers and withers. And as the light of your soul dawns in full illumination, all of that egoic patterning that had been causing your suffering will be surprisingly absent. And you will have been auspiciously freed of an inner conversation where you will look back at your life and go, I spend so much time tracking my progress and understanding the conditioning of my family. And I find myself in a space where I don't know where any of that is, as if it never even happened. There's nothing to track. There's nothing to get. because you only become more of yourself by how much of your ethics comes to life inspired by the surprising 
grace of daring to lose. And if you think handing it over first is going to be the shortcut, that's just how we try to avoid the pain of loss. You can't hand it all over because that's an option. No, 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 no. You have to just have what you have and let life call your number. Like spiritual bingo. And I said in the very beginning of this that this would all end with inevitable laughter. And some of you in this audience are already there. Because the laughter or the smirk or the huh, huh, is you coming into full realization and contact with the fact that there is an organized intelligence within you doing all of this. And you have a variety of options in this game and play. And of course, in the future transmissions, I'll illuminate that. But if you were given more options than you have right now, you wouldn't become as perfect as each of us are bound to be. That's what we rest in. Because once we start having a conversation about reality, now we can really heal. But we have to really talk within the construct of reality. And not sleepwalking in a dream of gaining and losing. And only when we start talking within the view of reality do we have the awareness and perspective that no matter how much I gain or how often I lose, I only deserve more love, not less. To each of our hearts, to our hearts that beat in the bodies of all, for the awakening of unity consciousness across this planet, to inspire greater awakenings on all planets, to raise the vibration of this earth, so to raise the vibration on all levels, and to even raise the vibration on this planet so decisively that it actually gives birth to even greater levels of undiscovered enlightenment and opens up greater corridors in the kingdom of heaven. We say to our heart on behalf of all, I love you. Whether we're gaining or losing or somewhere in between, I love you. I love you. Where life is going, whether life is going your way or seems like it's against you, however you want to see it, I love you. 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 Hey Matt, what does the universe want me to know? That this is only for your good. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Do you know what energy you feel right now? A field of willing participants. Now our lives can begin. 
because now we're ready to live. No longer is the universe a big, ver like a big cosmic version of Amazon Prime. Now we are willing participants and ready to live on life's terms. Because life has a plan. And life's plan becomes your plan with less and less options. As so many of you in this room and on YouTube are feeling the truth of this, it's because you're ready to actually be happier with less options. And it's okay for others that have any other opinion of this, but it will be caused by someone who thinks that what I'm saying is an option. This isn't being spoken by someone who has options. This is being spoken to you by someone who doesn't need more options. I found my path. I serve you in every moment. And whatever happens to me, I, exp I turn myself inside out and I live and demonstrate what I teach. I don't need options. Destiny found me. I was given the options, yes or no. I said, yes, that's it. And here we are. Someone once asked me, what's it like to live as you? And all, all I said is, less options than you can imagine. And I'm the happiest I've ever been. Go figure. <laughs>